not. How's it going? <laughs> it's anymore. going well. How are you doing? Good. I apologize. It's going to make like some sound. All right. I'm on the road again. The place with the fancy ceiling that you like so much. I love um, that ceiling. That's pretty cool. Um, I'd and, be happy uh, if you could do all your hangouts from that room. <laughs> no, just just. I hate your there. turquoise wall. I Every love you. Out, yeah. I hate your turquoise wall. Oh, I'll just leave it forever just to punish you. Um, <laughs> no, no, we have plans. We're repainting. We're repainting. Um, or have something even cooler. It's on my list of to-do items. Okay, so uh, this is the last episode of Astronomy Cast for this season. And our 350th episode that has a number on it, which means we're like at 375 or something in reality. Yeah, with all of the question shows that we've done and then... And then, not to mention all the other stuff we've done. Yeah, we've we've had a lot of uh, a lot of episodes, yeah. good times. <laughs> but um, it's not it's not our last episode ever. It's just our last episode for the season. So every summer we try to take off a couple of months and not make shows. And everyone's busy. It's hard to kind of organize all of the all the people. So so today is going to be the last episode of Astronomy Cast until the Dragon Con show, which is going to be Labor Day weekend. And we have a topic. Yeah, I love it too. Rain was, Rain was like, you know, I want like all the hard, the impossible questions that you guys get asked. Yeah. What are, is, what are the ten big difficult questions in astronomy right now? And yeah. so we're gonna have a whole crew of people on with us, and it's just gonna be kind of awesome. Yeah, totally. I'm really. When she suggested the topic, I was like, yes, I love it. So I, I can't wait. It's gonna be really fun. Uh, yeah, so it's Labor Day weekend. Dragon Con, Atlanta, we'll be there. Uh, I have a full Jedi costume I have not worn yet. Really? Yeah. I'm uh, I'm bringing uh, a big chunk of the crew, bringing Nancy and Elizabeth are coming as well. So. Yeah. And we're bringing the whole SIUE crew just like we usually do. And so... It's going to be a party, so you should all yes. join us. And I, I'm actually a guest this year, which is, you know, yeah. They finally acknowledged your awesomeness. Well, they finally acknowledged that being a host of a co-host of Astronomy Cast is worth being a guest, you know, as opposed to being a guest of Astronomy Cast, like you, is always a guest. Anyway, I'm not. I'm I, now. I'm, now it's all is forgiven. I've been accepted into the in crowd. So, right. <laughs> um, so yeah, and so then also last episode of the Weekly Space Hangout is going to be tomorrow. And then same deal. We're going to take the uh, take the summer off because it's just too much cat wrangling. It's already been it's already tough. We had to cancel the last two because everybody's been really busy with their summer vacations and all that. So we're going to be doing um, our next episode of the Virtual Star Party on the seventh. So we're going to be doing them once a month. So once on the seventh, once in once in August. So that's still going to happen over the summer because it's a little more. Well, it's a little. It's nice in the summer. So and, some and objects I'm we want to show. Take I'm hoping to take all my spare time, free time, it, neither really truly exist. I'm hoping to repurpose my astronomy cast time to spend some more time reading for 365 days of astronomy so we'll get more and more episodes over there. So it's not like yeah. our voices are going away, they're just going into different places because you yeah, have your yeah. YouTube video series and yeah. we want yeah, to create okay. all the things. I know, I know, yeah. I mean, if people think that we're going to like take this time off, they're crazy. <laughs> we're just going to be trying to catch up on all the other stuff that we've had to put off as we've been uh, has been working. And I got a new yes. job, which I mentioned last week. So I'll go into that, you know, what I'm doing right now a little more. When once we, do we the, hit yeah, yeah. record. Yeah, once we, once we do the episode. So uh, as always, um, we're going to take about 30 minutes to record this episode of Astronomy Cast. You can stick around at the end, and we'll answer some questions about space and astronomy. Um, very briefly. Cause very briefly, yeah, I know. Yeah, and i got to run too. So, But use the Q&A app. I'm going to say hi to Helga Bjorkaug and Guido Bibra and Peter W. Who are watching right now. Thanks, everyone. Um, okay. So are you ready-ish? I am. Okay. I'm going to be recording on my Zoom today. I so. am going to remember to put my computer into mono. It's in mono. Okay. Mono. I'm pressing record. I have also pressed record, and it is working off the mic input on the gadget. So let's hope this works. Hope it doesn't sound too like, horrible. I apologize in advance, Preston, because it's uh, um, yeah. Yeah, oh, and uh, I'm on campus, Preston. We adore you, Preston. We're sorry we torture you, Preston. 
Um, Guido, no, so you're right. It's on Friday, sorry. The, uh, the weekly space hangout is on Friday. Normal time, not, not tomorrow. I'm just completely... We don't know when we are. Throughout. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Timey whiny. We will do lobby. Um, okay, there we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 350, Spaceship One. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. So this is episode 350, and the last episode we're going to be doing for our summer hiatus. So uh, we'll be recording... We got this episode today, and then we'll be taking two months off, and then the next episode you'll hear should be the live episode from DragonCon, um, which will happen over Labor Day weekend 2014, live in Atlanta. If you're going to be going to DragonCon, we'd love to see you. We will have booths, we will have stuff and things, and t-shirts and lanyards, and hugs. science. We shall High science fives. you. High fives, hugs, handshakes, we'll sign things, we'll go for coffee, it'll be fun. So, uh, hang out with us. Um, and so then the other thing, which I think was is kind of appropriate, I mentioned last week about the new job that I've taken on working for HeroX, and which is a division of a uh, spin-off from the XPRIZE Foundation, but the goal is to try and make crowd, essentially anybody, be able to make an XPRIZE. And uh, so you should come check it out at HeroX.com, but specifically, just to sort of demonstrate how this is all going to work, I've created my own challenge, and I'm calling it the Self-Replicating Robot Challenge. And so the way this works is I want to see a robot make another robot, and those two robots make a third robot, and, uh, which I don't think has been done. And so, um, and so the way this works is I want to raise $100,000 and then from everybody. And then we all be like, yes, I want to see this in the world. I want to see robots capable. Now, obviously, the space exploration angle of this is that we want to be able to send probes to Mars and the moon and have them build more copies of themselves. Imagine if we could send Curiosity to Mars and have it craft another Curiosity. So there's a lot of technology, but, you know, if we can figure this out, it would be amazing. So come to HeroX.com slash self-replicating robot and pledge. Join me, you know, kick in a couple of bucks, and just show that we want to see this thing exist. And then if we can get to 100,000, or, you know, then maybe we can start this actual challenge and see if people can make this thing happen. So, It's uh, robots building robots so the world can be to taken over by self-replicating robots. No, no, it's very clear. No Grey Goo, no Terminators, no Replicators from Stargate SG-1, no Berserkers. You know, it's just, it's good, nice, lovable... Can we have a DRM from Almost Human? Because they're kind of awesome. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen that. Um, anyway, so that's it the thing. It got canceled. We... Fox cancels all the good sci-fi. Oh, really? <laughs> so here's the thing. So let's, uh, I guess we should get on with the show now. So, um, <laughs> so Spaceship One, hey, which is part of the XPRIZE Foundation, uh, is a spacecraft created by Scaled Composites to win the $10 million Ansari XPRIZE in 2003. It was the first privately built spacecraft to reach 100 kilometers in altitude twice in two weeks, carrying the equivalent of three people. It's the prototype of the upcoming Spaceship Two, created for Virgin Galactic to carry paying passengers into space. Now, uh, yeah, so I didn't know that you had, you didn't pick this topic, you know, when I got a job. So, uh, but this is part of our number series, and I guess this is probably going to be the last one. Which is yeah. Space. So, so I had a, a moment. I, I had a moment of, I was originally thinking, well, what are the important numbers? We've had Mercury 7, and then my brain went to STS-51L, which was the Challenger disaster. And I was like, no, we can't end the summer on that. We cannot. Too soon. Too soon. So, yeah. so in the midst of my, oh, bad idea, bad idea, bad idea, I was like, what other spacecraft have awesome numbers and are uplifting? And Spaceship One is kind of as uplifting as a numbered thing coming out of the space program has been recently. So, yeah, I went with Spaceship One, and I figured it would give you warm fuzzies since you now yeah, work totally. with the X Prize folks. And yeah. Um, yeah, life is good. So, okay, so let's get, let's do some history then. So, where did Spaceship One come from? Well, it it largely came out of Bert Rattan's brain. I mean, it wasn't 
born forth like Athena popping fully fledged out of his skull. But um, starting in the 1990s, he started thinking about what would it take for us to start doing commercial space flight and he started pulling together teams and then with the Ansari X Prize coming out in the ten in the early 2000s which was nor which was uh, originally just the X Prize uh, eventually the Ansaris came forward and added to the pot and that's where the name changed the Ansari X Prize but um, it, it really was just over a few brief years where Bert Rotund was able to drive the idea forward, largely funded by Paul Allen of, of the Amazon fortune, um, and they were able to very quickly go from, hmm, how should we build this, to building it, to test flying it in May 2003, to hitting uh, sub-orbit passing that 100 kilometer mark for the first time in June 2004 to, oh my gosh, winning the Ansari X Prize in October of 2004. Um, so once they set their mind to it, it was a matter of a few years, but the ideas were ones that Bert Rattan started playing around with in, in the mid-90s. Yeah, I mean, if you've done any research into Bert Rutan and seen scaled composites, they have this wonderful history of these amazing aircraft that just go back. You know, a lot of craft building aircraft designers or, just, you know, aircraft enthusiasts have ordered various um, scaled composite aircraft. And um, I think they contributed to the one that went around the world um, on one tank of fuel. So, so he's got this innovative... Uh, method of building aircraft that are that are designed you know he's always going for simplicity always going for safety and and able to sort of crack what were normally very complicated problems with some combination of you know of his technology so it's and, a pretty amazing company I, I love how much the idea for this aircraft changed spacecraft aircraft over the the 10 years from starting it in 93 to first flight in 2003 he he was originally just planning a more capsule based spacecraft the old standby uh, land and water no big deal and then basically got inspired by a shuttlecock of all the crazy things one of those things that you use while playing badminton it was like oh wait and and from that inspiration was born this origami spacecraft that goes from one layout of the wing structure for launch, a different for re-entry, and yet a third for landing. And yeah, so let's talk about then sort of the, the components, because it's actually a fairly complicated way the whole thing works. But you know, but in the end, as you, you know, as you said, it's very cool and simple simple and gets the job done. So so sort of what's the if you went and walked up to Space Shop One, what would you be seeing, you know, when it's on the ground still? Uh, well currently you can actually walk up and see it in the US Air and Space Museum, which is kinda cool. But the part that's missing from the US Air and Space Museum is White Knight One. So Spaceship One was designed to fly on the underbelly of White Knight One, which is a giant high altitude flying aircraft that was designed in a way that it could be used for uh, reconnaissance, it could be used for carrying things to high altitude like it does with Space Shift 1. It has all of these different applications, but the greatest one of all is once you start getting up to that 45,000 feet, 50,000 feet altitude that it's capable of, you're above more than 85% of the Earth's atmosphere in most cases. Once you're above all that atmosphere, you're dealing with a lot less drag. Gravity is still pretty much of a bear, but the air is the big issue you have to deal with. So White Knight carries up Little Spaceship One on its underbelly. Um, it hangs there rather like a bomb, which actually got White Knight One in trouble when it tried to land in Dulles the first time, um, and actually wasn't allowed to land there because it looked like it was carrying a bomb. Wow. Um, yeah, they had issues trying to deliver it to the Smithsonian. 
Uh, so, so White Knight takes off carrying Spaceship One on its underbelly, gets up to somewhere between 45,000 and 50,000 feet, and it drops Spaceship One. And for some period of time that they don't tell you, uh, the pilot on board Spaceship One is adjusting the trim, getting everything happy, and then presses the ignition, and it fires. And at this point, you now have a rocket craft in, in the spirit of the early suborbital flight, flights that uh, were dropped off of bombers back in the 1950s. Um, very quickly goes into a straight vertical climb, uh, climbs for several minutes until the rockets cut off, at which point it's going so fast that it just gets carried the rest of the way up to its about 100 kilometer altitude. So it's it's a pretty dramatic day when you're taking off on one of these things. But once you're up there, um, hits the apex of its journey, and then reconfigures its wings again, flipping them up so you have the belly of Spaceship One facing the ground. Um, by facing the ground, it, it's creating the most drag it possibly can and flips the wings up into the feathered position. It actually takes it about 15 seconds to move everything up and this, this is an interesting moment. Um, once it's feathered, it tries to re-enter at about 65 degrees and it slows down and you're pulling about five times the force of gravity as you decelerate through the atmosphere like a shuttlecock. Right, right. And that's really the key and this is this, back this idea like let's look around for some natural resources we can use to assist our flight. In this case the, the solution is to use the the configuration of the wing, the increasing, the slowly increasing air resistance to configure the, the aircraft to both slow it down and put it into an optimal flight path to be able to then continue out and, and land. And I just find it so amazing that they fire the rockets until they're only about 150,000 feet up, but they're going 2,000 miles per hour at that point. So they're able to get a long, nice, quiet glide up Anyone to space. Anyone who's played Kerbal Space Program knows it, it, how that works, that you, you, know, you run out of, uh, out of you know, accelerant propulsion, and yet your rocket just keeps going and going and going until it reaches the height of its, you know, until it reaches its apogee, and then, and then the down is bad, too. So... And, and then it does the badminton birdie from 100 kilometers yeah. back down to about... 50,000, 60,000 feet again, so you're still far higher than a 747 flies. But once they hit that point, uh, they then changed the spacecraft into a glider. It's, it's actually designated with an FAA call number that is a glider designation, and it glides the rest of the way down, and I think the most amazing thing I learned while reading about this is how fast a turnaround all of this is. It's about 10 to 15 minutes from the point that it hits the I'm going to become a glider again um, for it to return all the way back to its landing strip uh, where it took off with, with White Knight and Spaceship One will actually typically beat the White Knight back. Right. <laughs> um, okay, so kind of let's um, let's talk a bit about sort of when things happened in leading up to it actually winning the X-Press. So it, it's first carried up, left Mojave Spaceport um, was May 20th of 2003. Um, it hit a top speed while being carried of half the speed of sound. It went up about 14 kilometers, flew for about two hours, and they just sort of had Spaceship One dangling beneath White Knight. So, utterly boring. Um, but still kind of cool. Um, from that, they went on to, to carry it one more time in July. Um, this time they had an astronaut on board, Mike Melville, who would eventually be the first commercial astronaut, the first man to, to cross that 100-kilometer barrier. 
Um, they very quickly, in August of 2003, started doing glide tests. They continued doing glide tests up until December of 2003, at which point they did their, their first firing of the rockets. They didn't actually go very high. They just climbed to 20 kilometers. They climbed for about six kilometers above where they started. This time it was being piloted by Brian Binney, who uh, was the pilot when, when they eventually won the X Prize. Um, the third man who uh, got to, to fly it was Peter Siebold. He unfortunately was not able to, to ever fly it up above the 100 kilometer mark, so he didn't get the title of commercial astronaut. Um, but they kept testing, kept doing power testing, kept pushing it a little bit higher, a little bit higher, hit 32 kilometers in April of 2004, hit 64 kilometers in May of 2004, and then June 21st, 2004, they almost made it to Mach 3. They made Mach 2.9 and just edged over the 100 kilometer altitude. They, they actually had to get it confirmed and they didn't know instantly if they had done it or not. Um, during a 24-minute flight, Mike Melville qualified as the first commercial astronaut ever in the world. Right, and um, then the requirements of the XPRIZE were that you had to carry the equivalent of three people, so the pilot and two passengers, and so in this case they just carried weight with Mike Melville, um, and you had to complete this within two weeks? Two flights in two weeks and you couldn't replace more than 10 percent of your non-fuel mass. So if you think about race cars or certain things you always swap out, you swap out the tires, things like that. That's cool. But the idea was you had to be building a reusable spaceship. And, and so there's that 10 percent of your mass cut. So they tested some things some more. Then in September, they went for the record. So on September 29th, 2004, Mike Melville took off, hit 103 kilometers, 102.93 kilometers, and scared every single person who was watching. Because with their feathered design, there are some known points that they call built-in features that cause spins that look rather radical and terrifying. <laughs> and so there were a whole lot of people watching going, are they going to die? Um, because it started doing some massive spins. Um, but this is a feature of having the feather design. And Mike and Bert Rattan both said no. We knew this was possible. We knew the model showed it could do this. It was fine. We were never out of control. We were just spinning. <laughs> right. <laughs> and <laughs> trying to make the world feel better, Mike uh, Melville actually said things along the lines of, yeah, I actually pulled out my camera to get some pictures out the window, window and the spins gave me some great views of the Earth as it rotated by. And uh, everyone else is going, okay, that was a little yeah. bit terrifying. Are you sure you It was like ready? Felix Baumgartner when he did his jump from the balloon, and he was spinning, and you just looked at that and just went, oh, this is, this is not good. No. But he was able to pull it out, and, and, you know, in the case of Spaceship One, it was just designed to do exactly this, and when it got enough wind, it was able to orient itself exactly the way it was supposed to, and everything was fine. It was a feature, not a bug. Um, yeah. Give the pilot a, a, a view of the Earth from upside down. Yeah, you something. You want that, yeah. <laughs> Um, and and then less than a week later, I mean, they, they had two whole weeks, but less than a week later, on October 4th, they uh, went more than three times the speed of sound. They achieved 112 kilometers, and Brian Benny um, won them the Ansari X Prize, the $10 million prize that did nothing to cover the cost of the spacecraft, but... They, they got the award and went down in history. And, and if you think about it, this is something we've never done and we haven't repeated. They launched regular service, two launches in less than a week, of the same spacecraft. 
They actually had additional launches prepared, but they sort of did a wait. This was historical. This was awesome. Let's just deliver it to all the awesome places and then take it to the Smithsonian. So they then proceeded, um, and by them I mean Bert Rattan, um, and the rest of the crew decided, let's take this thing on a tour. So they then went on a road show. Um, July 2005, they went to the Oshkosh Air Show, which, if you're an air flight enthusiast, is kind of the air show. People fly in, drive in from all over the world to see all that's new and awesome and old and put together well um, in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Um, Mike Melville and crew then flew White Knight with Spaceship One down to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and uh, Melville decided to make a moment in history and um, Wilbur Wright had given a famous speech called Some Experiments in Flight and um, Mike Melville decided to give a talk with the exact same title at, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and from there they attempted to deliver it to the Smithsonian um, but Poor Mike Melville, while trying to land at Dulles, which was where they were supposed to land, uh, apparently the the flight controllers took one look at, at White Knight and went no. And um, refused to let them land because it looked like they were carrying a bomb underneath White Knight. And I guess if dropped incorrectly, Spaceship One would be an extraordinarily expensive bomb. But um, it, it turned out that Mike Melville had to do some fast talking to convince a different nearby airport to let them land. And I think that falls as the strangest air traffic control moment I've ever heard of. That's funny. Um, so now this was, I mean, this was the end of the, the story for Spaceship One, but, but, you know, right short after that, Virgin Galactic comes in and gets rolling on sort of the future plans for what Spaceship One will eventually become, which is a tourist service to the edge of space. And, and this is where we have formed in 2004 was Virgin Galactic, where um, Richard Branson of Virgin Everything, um, Virgin Mobile, Virgin Air, Virgin this, that, and the other thing, um, he invested and partnered with Scaled Composites and they started building um, Spaceship Two, which there's actually two of them. There's the VSS Enterprise and the VSS Voyager and these fly on two different uh, White Knight Two model carrier aircraft, VMS Eve and VMS Spirit, um, Spirit of Steve Fawcett. Uh, both of them have paintings on the side of them that preclude showing them to small children uh, in some communities I've found. Um, so if you have small children, open the picture and make decisions before you show them the White Knights. Um, but they're already selling tickets. And, and you can make your own reservation for $250,000 per person. And... Um, there's over 700 people who've already put down their deposit to fly to space for a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, we've been waiting for it to happen, and it just, it, you know, that company still hasn't gotten, you know, there's been a lot of tests with Spaceship Two, and yeah. the, I mean, the White Knight Two is is much bigger. I mean, the, the Spaceship Two spacecraft is much bigger, too. It's really this... Um, scaled up, really scaled up version of the Spaceship One. But in this case, it's got, you know, nice comfortable seating inside, room for lots of people, plenty of barf bags, I'm hoping. Uh, <laughs> and and, and uh, these are going to be some pretty adventurous people who are going to finally uh, do this. And one of the, the things that they've run into is in 2014 they changed what type of a fuel they're using, they changed what type of a model they were using in 2012. Bert Rattan retired in 2011 and I'm sure that that affected how things were progressing. Yeah. So they, they also had to try and recover from in 2007 they, they had an explosion while they were testing one of their engines. But they keep 
they keep plowing forward. Uh, they have uh, worked on constructing Space Sport America down in New Mexico, which is the most amazingly beautiful design for a commercial launch facility I've ever seen. Take yeah. the stunningly beautiful airport you've ever seen and like turn up the futuristic dial. It's it's gorgeous. You better have swooshing doors. That's what I want to see. <laughs> I, um, I can't speak to the doors. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, and so I think, you know, it's funny because like on the one hand, when that happened, we all felt like this is it. Private space flight is is unleashed. We've hit 100 kilometers altitude, but the thing is that 100 kilometers altitude, straight up, is night and day from actually going all the way into orbit. And so, you know, the kind of technology that's required for a private spacecraft to be able to reach orbit is a whole other level, or another order of magnitude here. And so, there's not a lot of use to go, apart from some scientific use and tourism, there's not a lot of use to get up to 100 kilometers and then come back down. And, you know? and it's really a stretch to call it suborbital when you land at the same place you took off. Yeah, and so I think that there were, you know, you could see there being some, some applications in transportation, right? You, you get into your Spaceship 1 or Spaceship 2 uh, launch craft in Los Angeles, and then you arrive in New York City an hour later having gone through this horrifying parabolic arc the whole way. Um, but that. so I think there are some, you know, I think we're still kind of waiting. And it feels a bit like, like we're recreating the moon landings, that, you know, the folks, humans landed on the moon, and then, and then. Yeah. And then. So I really do hope that Spaceship 2 and Virgin Galactic gets rolling and that maybe there are some applications of well, and, and where 700 people have paid a quarter of a million dollars, um, that's a whole lot of investors going, well. And, and they do get them together on a regular basis, and they are continuing to make progress. Um, it's just, yeah. it's not the 2014 launch goal they originally had. It, it turns out spaceflight is hard. Yes. Surprise, so, surprise. No surprise. one ever guessed. Surprise, surprise. Space foot is hard. Um, cool. Well, I think that's all I got, Pamela. Okay. Sounds great. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for everything, and we will see you. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of months. Not next Dragon week. In a couple Con. of months. At Dragon Con. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. I'll talk to you later. All right. Everybody, stick around. This is way easier for me now. I just press stop. Okay. There are dogs. And want I to want to give love. credit. I have these truly awesome disgruntled hamsters behind oh. me that bring me no end of pleasure. And they're from the Earth World webcomic. And and if you want to have disgruntled hamsters in your life trip too, go check out Earth World. It's actually really good. It's awesome. It only has uh, one disgruntled hamster in the comic, but you have two, two of them. I have two because they're awesome thugs of hamsters. Um, so Guido Bibra has dug up from Universe Today, July 21st, 2004, uh, an article written by Fraser Kane. Success for Spaceship One. I've been doing this for a long time. Yes, you have. We're old. We're I, the old people of new media. Yeah, isn't that funny? Um, and he wondered if there's any references to an Astronomy Cast episode at that time. Uh, were we, what we year? Doing we started cast? in 2006. Yeah, so there was no Astronomy Cast. Yeah, Slacker hadn't even started yet because that started February of 2005. Podcasting, actually, the technology didn't exist till October of 2004. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> it's been a while. Um, I. Isn't that crazy? Like we've been yeah. podcasts for almost ten years now, too, um, and they're just—they feel like they're just now starting to really take off with Mike Mara God, and then I've been you podcasting know, Nerdist. For years. Yeah. Um, Ray R asks: uh, In addition to commercial flights, pleasure cruises, does Spaceship One have any definite plans to work with NASA? Uh, not so much NASA. They do have plans to periodically launch racks of materials for schools. 
NASA is working with SpaceX, Blue Origins, and one other one that I can never remember the name of because I'm a horrible person, and they have a really weird logo. Uh, <laughs> Nikolai Ivanov says that Buzz Aldrin said that Richard Branson invited him on the first flight of his little thing, and he refused. I guess compared to Saturn V, the Spaceship Two is little. Um, also, I it think is. it would be terrifying which is another reason why you might not want to do it, and dangerous. Sean Kennedy says, I have all summer to catch up on all the podcasts I missed. So, yes, have a good summer, everyone. Yay! You cool. can catch up, Sean. And then we'll fill your, your device with more podcasts come fall. Um, uh, Peter W. asks, I read an article about the Advanced Technology Large Aperture Space Telescope today. Do you know how the study is progressing? Are you... Aware of that mission? Hold on. Say that again. Uh, the the Atlas, the Advanced Technology. No, that one I don't know. Oh, no. I haven't even heard of that. The what? What? Has it already launched? No. Oh, it's a mission concept. So what you're hitting is the problem mm. of spacecraft are dead to me until they're actually almost launched. Except for and the the, um, the terrestrial planet finder, which is just dead. Uh, five times, five to ten times better angular resolution than um, James Webb, and two thousand times better than Hubble. So uh, w sounds great. First comes first. Follow W first, and and if W first makes it to construction, this will be next. So root for W first, and then we'll start to contemplate this one. I think it's safe to say that there will probably be bigger aperture, more better. I mean, I think the big lesson that we really learned with Hubble, and I'm sure we're going to learn with James Webb, is that if you just put an, a, a lot of glass up in space, good things happen. The, the issue becomes one of how do we afford more and more spacecraft with decreasing numbers of salary dollars. Oh, are budgets going down? Yes. Oh, yeah. No budget. So, so the problem is that if you start looking at how much money goes to the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, to the ALMA Radio Array, to Curiosity and James Webb Space Telescope, suddenly you've consumed uh, a, a very significant percentage of NASA's budget. Then, or astronomy's budget, NASA and National Science Foundation both. Yeah. Factor in all the rest of the existing missions, and suddenly there's fewer and fewer dollars left to pay for things like humans. Well, and it always comes to this age-old question about, you know, do you just put a great big generic technology up in space, you know, a great big telescope, or do you create purpose-built missions designed to answer some specific question? like It's the Rocky Kolb simon white debate. Yeah, do you, do you map out dark energy? Are you searching for variable stars? Are you looking to probe the cosmic microwave background radiation? Or do you just want to put a great big telescope that can do kind of anything? Well, and, and, and this is where you end up with compromised systems like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope that is designed in a way that are go it is going to find all the remaining asteroids one kilometer and higher that might kill us. But after it's done with that mission, we're going to have a giant telescope. Which will have value. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a that's a good way to approach it. Have a specific mission and then at the same time use it for other things. So cool. Okay, now I know you can't stick around. You've got uh, you're about to fly away. Um, I, I am going to a family wedding. Nice. In my country. In your country. Well that's because my husband is one of your comrades in arms. I know. I know. We're actually you... comrades in peace because you're Canadian and awesome <laughs> that way. So sorry. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, well, hey, as always, it's been super fun working with you over this season and all the previous seasons. 350 episodes, Pamela. How, how cool is that? High five. It's, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> it really is. Um, and so thanks to all the fans who've been watching. And one last plug, if you have time, come on over to HeroX.com slash self-replicating robot and uh, post a comment. Give me some ideas. Pledge. This, no money's changing hands. You just click pledge, and then I just write it's down. Robots making robots. Make robots making robots. Um, and this is this is how we're gonna make. Uh, you're gonna 
dismantle Mercury and turn it into a Dyson sphere. So, you know, this is how we're going to... Yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay, well, anyway. Then the Earth wouldn't get sunlight anymore. I have problems with that one. All the electricity. No, no, no. We just we'd push it out beyond the Earth, and then okay. we'd have this okay. Dyson sphere. We could then let's on. just turn Mars into a Dyson sphere. Done. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, well, hey, thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll see you all next two months. See you in September. All right. And Dragon Con, Dragon Con, if you can come, we'd love to see you. Costumes. All right. I can't wait to see your costume. All <laughs> right. We'll see you later, everyone.